It's not smart water. Stupid water, not smart water. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> What's that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it hasn't helped make me any smarter. Or any nicer. Is it, is it nice water? Is that... This has not worked. This is fraud. It says nice water. Of course, I, I do think I'm kind of a nice guy. Where's the love? We need love water. That's what we need. Yeah. It's Minnesota nice. So that there you go. That explains it. Here's, would you like some Minnesota nice water? Maybe it'll help you be nice. 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 Wicked. That's all they say. Wicked. They do. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to try to get through this one here, amen. Um, and then after that, this afternoon, after lunch, we will just, we'll have a time of prayer and hymns and, uh, and some testimonies, amen. Uh, and then I may just pick up more on separation on Wednesday, and then maybe even cover it again next week, I'm not sure. I don't think you can have too much of this in understanding this um, this doctrine of separation, which you rarely, rarely ever hear anything about. Amen. All right. Anyway, um, just trying to think. I'll pray for Brother Russ. He's going to preach a sermon next week. He was going to preach it this week, but he's not been feeling well. Pray for him. His, his diabetes has been really acting up and stuff, so uh, it's been really flaring up. So just pray for him um, that, uh, that he would... Uh, that he'd be okay and everything. He's just kind of making him sick lately, and they gave him some medication or something that he he really isn't too fond of taking, to be honest with you. But but uh, just pray for him right now. He's uh, going through a lot there with that. And then uh, <clears throat> pray for the work there, okay? All that the Lord is doing there. And uh, pray for um, some of these other things. We'll, we'll talk about that. I'll save that for this afternoon, and we'll take some. We'll we'll, we'll uh, pray over some things. The men, while the men stand up and pray, ladies can obviously bow their head and pray at the same time. But uh, um, anyway, but uh, <clears throat> we will uh, we'll deal with some of, some of those things and sing some hymns and uh, praise God, Amen, for all His goodness and give some testimonies of what the Lord's been doing and interesting times that we've had out preaching and just some other things, whatever the Lord lays on your heart. <clears throat> as far as that goes, uh, we can talk about. Uh, some of those things this afternoon. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, somebody asked me that that box back there that looks kind of funny. Yeah, that's an offering box. <laughs> I don't talk about offerings. Um, I don't pass pass the plate around anymore. We used to do that a long time ago. We used to play a song for you. By the way, it never did help you people give anymore. I'm just saying. <laughs> That song was supposed to romance you or something, but it didn't. I, I've seen that somewhere, the romance of, of, of hymns or something. It was like the ro like a service. They, that music is designed to get you to give. So they, I don't know what it is, but it's designed to, <clears throat> and, and I don't mention offerings. Honestly, I, I don't. You, you that have been here for any time know that it's not something that I, I like. I, I don't preach about money that often. I really don't like to. Um, talk about it that much, but some people ask, yeah, that's a box, and I, what, Roy found that somewhere, and uh, it, but the hole was too small to fit checks inside and money, so I was like, Roy, I mean, I want to use that, but bro, you got to cut a hole in that thing, it's not big enough, yeah, don't, these are Baptists, don't make it too hard for them to give, <laughs> amen, don't make it too hard for them to give, all right, they can't handle that. Just kidding. Sort of. But, uh... <laughs> I 
All right. You listen, 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 listen to me, Anthony, okay? We're not Creflo Dollar here, okay? I I couldn't put hundred dollar bills on the stage and trample them. I'd have to put pennies up here, okay? And trample them, all right? I could preach a message. I, I'll take Creflo's message about getting AK-47s and lining you up because you don't give. And I'd line them all up and I'd blast them all out, he said, if they don't give. Wow. Okay. <laughs> like Betty Hinn. Stick that hand out there. This is the anointing hand right here. Let's say it here with the anointing here. Give a thousand dollars. is going to. Wow. You know, I, I find it, it's funny because I've had so many people email me. They're like, you know, we don't know how to give to your ministry. Because <laughs> so you, you don't really have anything online that tells anybody how to, how to do that. And I was like, oh. <clears throat> I said, okay, well, you can send it here if you want to do something. And, and, the, and then one guy, he, he, mailed, he mailed me something, and then it got sent back. <laughs> And he goes, he goes, and he emailed me and he said, Brother, I tried to give to your ministry and it got sent back. I was like, I'm sorry. And I gave him the right address or something. But it's just funny <clears throat> because we do believe the Lord will provide. Amen. And and he has. It's amazing to see what the Lord has done. Um, and uh, we're just grateful for all that God does. But I, I, money is not something we talk about a lot around here. Uh, but anyway, that's what that funny looking box is for back there. Uh, if you want to give something, you can put it back there. But uh, <clears throat> but I, I won't play. I won't serenade you with a song. Okay, we won't do that. We won't put you in the mood to give. We'll have Brother Paul stand up and scream at you. That'll that'll get you going. But uh, no, anyway. Yeah, you can. Wake the dead, almost. Praise God. I'm telling you. Never seen so many dead people mad at Paul before he's on the street. He even made zombies mad at him the other day, a couple weeks ago. Man, them zombies were mad at him. <clears throat> anyway, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> Please. All right. I'm hoping my voice holds out here. So, Brother Aaron, you might have to turn me up a little bit. I screamed too much the last time. So, no, I mean, I screamed too much the first message. I was mad at Paul, so I was screaming. I should whisper. That should be the way it works, whisper. That's right. <clears throat> All right, we're going to talk about separation. We're going to talk about separation from Rome. And it's, and it's whore daughters. Amen. That's strong speech. Sure is. It's in the Bible, too. How about that? Did you know there's a lot of strong speech in the Bible? It really wasn't a book written by a bunch of effeminate men that were scared of what people thought. <laughs> Isn't that something? I mean, you'd think today that the Bible was written by a bunch of effeminate men that were scared and were worried about what everybody thought, the way it's preached today, the way some people talk about it. That's not the way the Bible... It's so matter-of-fact... Just straightforward. You can take it or leave it if you don't like it. Amen? But your soul will be required of you. Amen? Revelation chapter 18. We're going to talk about separation from Rome. <clears throat> We're going to get into a few different things here because this is very important that you understand because Rome has its tentacles in just about everything and they are pushing forward rampantly in every area that you can imagine exactly what they're doing and it's so, some ways it's stealth and in other ways it's straightforward but i want to I, I at the same time i'm going to show you kind of a history of some things that they've done too as well so so you can understand okay so you can understand revelation chapter 18 and verse number four and i heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people that you be not partakers of her sins that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 14, we read from the Bible, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? But notice this, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what, hath, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You know, God has commanded a separation from this end times apostasy and, 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 and the Roman Catholic harlot that is found in Scripture. The mother of all harlots is what the Bible calls her. <clears throat> and she can be identified in many ways as Rome can. We're not going to do that here. We're just going to assume that you understand that the great whore is Rome and her apostasy. We're going we're gonna to take it for granted that that, that, that you understand that, and if not, go back and listen to a great number of sermons that have been preached on the topic, and uh, we'll give more evidence as time goes by uh, for more of that. But you know, one thing that, that is a movement that is being pushed today more than ever is an ecumenical, an ecumenical gospel, an ecumenical movement that is being forced and pushed into the churches around, especially in America, we're seeing this merging together of into, into this, 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 so to speak, one church or one religion or one movement. And I'm going to show you some of the ways that's taken place and the damage that it causes. But we have to be sharp and strong and stand firm on separation from that because too many people are shacking up with Rome today. Too many denominations, too many... Too many churches today have shacked up with Rome. They have, they have just, they've made an agreement with Rome. But what, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What agreement? There is none. What agreement could we have with Rome? None. We could have none. Remember the scriptural principles that were laid down first concerning personal separation that we talked about. Those really, those, those are the same principles that we live by concerning uh, ecclesiastical separation or separation on doctrinal stands. Now, we're not going to get into personal, you know, really every Bible doctrine. I want to get into institutional separation right now, really, is what we're going to cover. And then we'll cover doctrine specifically uh, soon. But I, I, I want to I bring your attention to this, that <clears throat> Rome is pushing for a one-world church. And they've openly pushed that since Vatican II. They've strongly and openly pushed it boldly with, 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 uh, and brazenly with Vatican II. And one of their arms that they've used is the charismatic movement to accomplish it. Man, has it ever worked. It has worked. <clears throat> we, do not, we, we are not to just to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Again, the principle is to reprove them. So we are to stand, not only uh, have no fellowship with Rome, but we are to stand and rebuke them. We are to rebuke that wicked spirit. We are to rebuke the wicked teachings of Rome. We are to stand firmly in doing that. You know, I want you to think about this. <laughs> if you've not heard that, by the way, it's interesting. One of the, the, one of the most hit sermons this last week was that five reasons or five things you should know about Christmas that I preached last week. If you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it. You'll understand some things about that that you need to know, some historical things. But I do find it fascinating how it is that so many Baptists become Catholic during the holidays. You say, come on, what do you mean by that? Well, so first of all, Rome invented Christmas, okay? They actually, they re, they actually renamed it, okay, is what they did. This doesn't come from any of the, the faith once delivered under the saints. You won't find anybody celebrating that in the Bible. You won't find the command to celebrate that from the Bible. You will find it. In 300 and on, you will find it's, it's being celebrated in the time of Constantine. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that, really, because I've already covered it. <clears throat> but just so you understand, it's not. But like Paul said, I'm afraid of you. He said, lest I labored in vain, why are you doing this? But now after that, you have known God 
or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Why are you going back to those things? Why are you going to those things? I'm afraid Baptists have learned the way of the heathen and jumped into agreement with Rome on Christmas. I believe it's a bridge to Rome. I, I believe it wholeheartedly. It is. It is a. It, it, they, Baptists lower their defenses. Just say that saying the word Christmas ought to make God's people cringe. Mass. Just even thinking that ought to make Baptists stand up and be like, "Man, I, ooh, I don't like that word, mass." I don't like that. They've joined in with Rome and pretend that we are commanded to observe it or that it's ordered after the fashion of Scripture, but it isn't. It has nothing to do with the birth of Christ. Rome's Christ is not the one of the Bible, and we must stand against her hellish doctrines and her bastardized religion. <clears throat> I say, like I said before, to hell with Rome and her doctrines. No peace with Rome, none. They are antichrist. Let him be accursed. <clears throat> Listen to this quote from Spurgeon, though. Since he was cursed who rebuilt Jericho, much more the man who labors to restore popery among us. In our father's day, the gigantic walls of popery fell by the power of their faith, the perseverance of their efforts, and the blasts of the gospel trumpets. And now there are some who would rebuild that accursed system upon its old foundations. O oh Lord, be pleased to thwart their unrighteous endeavors and pull down every stone which they build. It should be a serious business with us to be thoroughly purged of every error which may have a tendency to foster the spirit of popery. <clears throat> when we have made a clean sweep at home, we should seek in every way to oppose it. its all too a rapid spread abroad in the church and in the world. This last can be done in secret by fervent prayer and in public by decided testimony. We must warn with judicious boldness those who are inclined towards the heirs of Rome. We must instruct the young in gospel truth and tell them of the black doings of popery in the olden times. <clears throat> we must aid in spreading the light more thoroughly through the land. For priests like owls hate daylight. Are we doing all we can for Jesus and the gospel? If not, our negligence plays into the hands of the priestcraft. What are we doing to spread the Bible, which is the Pope's bane and poison? Are we casting abroad good, sound gospel writings? Amen. Rome is the mother of all harlots, and silence to this wicked system is a cover for her. Too many Baptists have been silent concerning Rome and her damnable heresies. You know, you can go to a lot of Baptist websites and try to look at their sermons, and they preach nothing against Rome. It's like they think Rome is dead. It's like they think that, that the apostasy of, of, of Rome and its tentacles and everything is dead, and it's not important that we should preach against it. It's not important that we should warn against it. But it is everywhere. They will not speak out against the mother of harlots. Rome has the most powerful system in the world. I had some Baptists get on there and be like, well, the Jesuits aren't sovereign. Well, of course they're not sovereign. I already know they're not sovereign. That's a dumb comment to make. <clears throat> but you know what they are? Extremely wealthy and powerful. That's right. They are the engineer core of hell. And let me tell you another thing. When you own... A country like the Vatican, okay? And when you have trillions of dollars at your disposal and you have diplomatic immunity, you are God on earth! No, come on, preacher. You're taking it too far. Really? How many Christian Christian leaders do you know could walk into the, 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 the blue Islamic mosque and pray? He just did two days ago. Now, how many Christians could do that? Christian leaders could do that in this world. Think. 
Why did he do that? Well, because if they didn't let him, he'd kill them all anyway. He'd just take the, the arm of the, of the military-industrial complex and try to give them liberty and freedom. What do you mean, preacher? Oh, he'd take the military and give them some democracy. Better shut up or you're going to get some democracy. Don't believe me? Watch. Anybody that defies that pope, that military-industrial complex, comes up, and they get a little democracy thrown at them. You want some liberty? Let me give you a little bit of liberty. Oh, man. <clears throat> That's the way it goes. <laughs> no, of course not. Really? Well, why does every president go over there and kiss the pinky finger? Tell me recognizing what? The temporal power of the Pope. You're a world leader bowing the knee and kissing his finger. What is that? Temporal power. I mean, I don't see him going up to any other pastor and kissing their hand. Hmm. We're commanded to come out of her, be not a partaker of her evil deeds, that you receive not of her plagues. Rome's damnable doctrine of infant baptism should not only be separated from, but it should be rebuked. And there's another thing. None of you ought to be attending any services where somebody is having their babies baptized. You are bastardizing the faith when you do. Don't do that. Too sharp a speech? Good. Not as sharp as landed in hell. Don't you going there is putting your stamp of approval on what they're doing. Amen. That you and I recognize that religious ceremony. Yeah, I recognize it as antichrist. Because infant baptism is the badge of the whore. It is antichrist. It is not biblical faith. And it is certainly not biblical baptism. Amen. You might as well mark them for hell while you're at it. How many people have we run across on the streets that say they got baptized and they were babies and they're Christians? Thousands of confused people. But preacher, there's nothing to get excited about. Why make such a big deal about everything? Just calm down. Maybe you had too much coffee. We should stand opposed to them. And by the way, that whole godmother, godfather thing they do and all that weird stuff, don't be a part of any of that nonsense either. Be separated from that. Separate from that stuff. Under no uncertain circumstances, explain them. You will not be a part of any of that. It is not biblical. That means you have to upset your mother, your father, your sister, your cousin, the dog catcher, the postman. So be it. Yeah, who is my mother, my father? That's right. <clears throat> we should never partake of their communion at their funerals either. I remember one time I, I first got saved and I went to this funeral. And that the guy was up there. And he was uh, the priest with his spooky outfit like the guy has down there. And uh, he was standing there, his, and he goes, well, if you want a blessing, if you, I, what was it? I think you cross like this if you wanted one or something. Is that, is that how it was? You, you cross like this. Brother John, you know, quit lying. Just <laughs> You're just there last week. That's why you were in here last week. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> is it this one? Is you cross if you want one? And if you don't, you put your arms down or something, and he'll just give you a blessing. And you know how he gives you a blessing? He takes this stuff that smells like opium. That reminds me of stuff I used to smoke when I was lost. And he just like goes, and this is his blessing that he does. He has a little ding dong bell he does, and he just ding dong. And he does this. And the other, the other one, they're crossing their arms and they're sticking the little cookie god in their mouth. And that's what they do. <clears throat> and I mean, I was standing in the back at this funeral, and they were like, okay, if you want to come forward. And, I looked around, I was like, whoa. 
And then they were going forward, and I watched them. I was like, that guy ain't touching me. I was newly saved. I was like, he ain't touching me with nothing. And you ain't putting no, no blessing on me. You're going to put a hex on me is what you're going to do. You stay away from me, you devil. I stayed in the back, man. I was like, I ain't going over there. I ain't walking up in that line either. Weirdo creep. <clears throat> That's not very nice. I know. I wouldn't plan on being nice. I got a cold. I'm kind of cranky right now, okay? First Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 20. <clears throat> we don't accept their communion or their baptisms, but I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. What's that mean? But quickly, this is what it means. It means when they take that, that cup and they, they do what's called transubstantiation, all right, it's witchcraft. Okay? Don't pull any punches. That's exactly what it is. Go watch a witch in their ceremonies. They do the exact same thing. Everything in their circle, everything that they're doing is the same thing witches do. Anyway, so they take this, and they say that turns that into the blood of Christ, the literal blood of Christ. And that cookie wafer God is literally Christ. And don't spill Christ. They, they used to make sure they didn't drop anything on the floor, right? Because if they did, they'd be dropping Jesus. What is that? Well, that'd be what I would call like an enchanted object, is what they're saying. They're trapping a spirit inside of there in their own mind. <clears throat> they probably are trapping devils inside of there. And then, they, and then they drink it. A few months ago, there was somebody that the Satanists stole the cookie. And they were going to do a black mass, and the priest was mad. I was like, why? He's just doing what you do. He's just doing it openly and calling it what it really is, Satanistic. You bunch of... Yeah, where does he go after you eat him? That's right. A bunch of Luciferian devils. It is. It is nasty. By the way, the reason why we cannot accept their communion is because either they are right or we are. <clears throat> one of the two is right. Which one is it? See, there's got to be a right and there's got to be a wrong. A biblical separation, institutional or, or ecclesiastical separation says, you know what, we know you're wrong and we're standing against you. Amen! Because after all, it's the table of devils. Either the Roman papacy is right, or we are, who follow the blessed King James Bible. By the way, they hate that Reformation era Bible. You know that, don't you? They absolutely hate that King James Bible. And we're going to talk about that right now, and I'm going to show you how much they hate that King James Bible. <clears throat> I'm going to give you some examples of it and some things that they said. And this is, I'm going to have to read fast here. Because Nate's getting hungry, so i got to get moving here. i just seen the look on his face. What's that? Not just Nate. Oh, Lee's getting hungry, too. Well, Lee's been gone for a few weeks, so I think I'll go a little longer today. <laughs> a little longer. Right, Brother, Brother Paul? That's only fair, isn't it, since he's been out? That's right. <clears throat> we got equal pay. we got equal time, okay? That's how that works. All right, I want to read you something that Sam Gipp wrote on Rome and the King James Bible. This is very good. He said, keep the people ignorant by controlling access to the Bible is one plan that Rome had, has. Number two, a counter, counter God's Bible with one of their own, which they did. Did you know that all Bible translations are not equal? Did you know that? Could you imagine that there could be a dirty, rotten mother of all harlots that could produce texts that would be corrupted, that would lead you away from Jesus Christ, or that would have error in them purposely to deceive you? Not Rome. They wouldn't do that. Ah, but yes, they would, and they do, and they have. Access to the Bible is controlled in two ways. First, the common man is persuaded that he cannot understand the scriptures and must subject himself to the authority of his priest and his private interpretation. Where this method can't be used, such as with non-Catholics, the Roman Catholic Church seeks to establish itself as a controlling factor in the government, preferably the starter religion, and then physically confiscates all copies of the Bible and destroys them. Objectors are killed. That doesn't happen. This pattern has been followed by the Roman Catholic Church for centuries with great success. 
The second method to eliminate the Bible is to replace it with one of Roman Catholic making. These then are used to fill in any gap left by the confiscation of the true Bible. In history, this has been done several times. When the Roman Catholic Church saw the popularity and the threat of the old Latin Bible called the Vulgate, from the Latin vulgar, meaning common, of 150 AD, they had their own Latin Bible translated from manuscripts, which had been corrupted in Alexandria, Egypt. Well, how's that? You mean they would name it the same thing? Yeah, but that trick's been tried before. Go read the lineages in Genesis. Read two of the lineages. The names are almost exactly the same. But they're different people. <clears throat> Listen to this anyway. Latin Bible translated from manuscripts, which has been corrupted in Alexandria, Egypt. This work was foisted upon a reluctant Roman Catholic scholar by the name of Jerome, and upon the publication in 380 AD, was promptly and shamelessly entitled The Vulgate. This worthless book sat unused for 800 years until the Roman Catholic Church eliminated the competition by burning all the original good Vulgates along with their owners. You mean they'd burnt the Bible and the people? Yeah. This, of course, ushered in the Dark Ages, a time of unsurpassed power for the Roman Catholic Church. To this day, most people, upon hearing a claim for the Latin Vulgate, the good one, 150 AD, erroneously, erroneously attribute it to the usurping Roman Catholic Vulgate of 380 A.D. See, just because it's called the Vulgate, it's the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. But that's Rome. Most New English translations available today are from these same corrupt Roman Catholic manuscripts. In the hands of the common man, these Bibles do nothing. They are perfectly safe to the powers that be. King James, whether he knew it or not, gave the common man back his most valued possession, the true Bible in English. The Roman Catholic Church had translated its own English Bible in 1582 in Reims, France. It was worthless. King's, King James and the translating committee may have never expected their new translation to go any farther than the shores of England, but God and the common man saw fit to carry it around the globe. Today, the common man is in grave danger of having his perfect Bible stolen from him again. <clears throat> this is being accomplished by two methods. Now listen! First, an attempt is being made and has been underway for almost 100 years to physically replace the King James Bible with Bibles translated from corrupt Roman Catholic manuscripts. These books are powerless and worthless, perfect for the job. Sadly, the King James is being attacked by many saved fundamental teachers and preachers who really may be well-intentioned, but who do enjoy the feeling of authority, the Roman Catholic Pope-like authority, and power that being able to correct the Bible brings them. This all-important transition is taking place in both churches and Bible colleges. The second area of conquest is the very brain of the common man. It is also, it is also is carried out into two phases. The first is a suppressive phase, in which the victim is bombarded with so much anti-King James propaganda that he is spiritually suppressed from, from mentally accepting the true perfect Bible. This method robs his brain of the Bible, even though his hands may possess it. In other words, his Bible has been stolen from his brain, but not taken from him physically yet. The second phase is the brainwashing phase. This is carried out by preachers, teachers, and especially Christian media. Christian radio stations have almost universally desisted from using the King James Bible. They have Bible readings, daily memory verses, and even read the Christmas story in Luke 2 from any Bible but the King James. This robs the subconscious mind of the true Bible. For you see, many Bible-rejecting preachers, upon trying to preach from a new version, are confronted by some unlearned and ignorant church member who, though unable to argue down the pastor's sales pitch concerning the new translation, retorts with, but that just doesn't sound like the Bible. By constantly hearing other versions read over the radio, TV, or in Christian schools, the younger generation of Christians will never have the benefit of subconsciously knowing what the Bible sounds like. So we see the real enemy of the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic totalitarian spirit found among some fundamentalists is not just the Bible. It is the Bible and the hand and heart of the common man. The same person that the devil hates and hopes to fill hell with. Has your Bible been stolen from your hands? What about your brain? I'm going to tell you something right now. If you don't think the devil would put counter... Would you trust Rome to translate your Bible? Let me ask you that. Would you want to use their corrupt texts that they use 
that were not used in the churches for centuries, but they were somehow hidden, which we're going to get to. Things that are different are not the same. Right, Brother Paul? Modern perversions based on the corrupt text. I want to read you something James Melton said in his research. The modern translations are based on the work of two 19th century Greek scholars from England, B.F. Westcott and F.G.A. Hort. Westcott and Hort, who were deeply involved in the occult. By the way, that's proven. We're going to deal with this on the radio, too. We're going to deal with these guys on the radio, this, the, the, the occultic behavior of these two. <clears throat> Westcott and Horde, who were deeply involved in the occult, hated the Texas Receptus Greek text from which the King James Bible was translated, so they conjured up their own Greek text. This Westcott and Hort Greek text was based primarily on two very corrupt 4th century Roman Catholic manuscripts. Codex, Codex Venaticus, Vaticanus, described in the Pope's library in 1481. Just what I want. And Sinaiticus, discovered in 1859 in the trash can at St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai. Hmm. So it was hidden, huh, in a trash can? That's where the Word of God was? No, the word of God was in the churches because they were using it. But Rome had to do something to counteract the Reformation. You understand? That's what it was about. The false perversions are a counter-Reformation act. That's what they are, counter-Reformation. Not the Pope. Surely he wouldn't want to counter the Reformation. He wouldn't put a false text out there to counter the works of the Reformation, would he? Well, we're going to read what the Jesuits say about that. Those Jesuits, those guys. Anyway, <clears throat> discovered in 1859 in a trash can at St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai. These are usually the older and better manuscripts that we keep hearing so much about. These manuscripts support most of the attacks in the new versions. The changes that are made in the new versions are all made according to these corrupted texts. You know, no Bible has seen revival like that King James Bible has seen. None in history. None. You remember that? So there had to be some counter-activity that took place. There had to be some counter-reformation uh, activity that took place to stop that, to impede it, to confuse people. Right? The Vatican is, is considered to be the most authoritative, although it is responsible for over 36,000 changes that appear today in the new versions. This perverted manuscript contains the books of the pagan apocrypha, which are not scripture. It omits the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy through Titus, the book of Revelation, and it cuts off the book of Hebrews at Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 14. A very convenient stopping point for the Catholic Church, since God forbids their priesthood in Hebrews chapter 10. Get out of there. All right. The attacks on the Word of God found in these manuscripts originated in Alexandria, Egypt, with the deceitful work of such pagan Greek scholars as Origen and Clement of Alexandria. Then in 313 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine, well, oh, that guy. You mean the same guy that brought in Christmas? Yeah, that guy. Well, he had a lot going on for him, didn't he? He was a busy fella. By the way, he also started incorporating churches. Did you know that? How about that? Incorporation started Christmas, incorporation, false perversions of the Bible. This is just history, folks. This is not like, nobody's like out there actively disputing Constantine and, and what he did. They just have all given into it. Because we are in the, the, the fascist Roman Empire right here. We just don't realize it, but that's exactly where we're at. We're smack dab in the middle of it right here today. <clears throat> Then in 318 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine ordered 50 copies of the Bible from Eusebius, the Bishop of Caesarea. Eusebius, being a devout student of Origen's work, chose to send him manuscripts filled with Alexandrian corruption, rather than sending him the true Word of God in the Syrian text from Antioch, Syria. So the corrupt Alexandrian text, also called the Egyptian or Heskian te type text, found its way into the Vatican manuscript then eventually into Westcott and Hort's Greek text, and finally into the new Bible versions in your local Christian bookstore. 
Therefore, when you hear or read of someone correcting the King James Bible with older or more authoritative manuscripts, you are simply hearing somebody try to use Roman Catholic texts to overthrow the God-honored texts of the Protestant Reformation and the great revivals. God has, God has never honored the corrupt text, and he never will. That's why we must separate from Rome and its text. One of the ways that we must separate is we must never accept those Roman manuscripts. We must never accept their false perversions of the Bible. We must stand opposed to that because if you don't have the Bible, you don't have the power of God. And that's what Rome knows. And every word matters. And these modern perversions, you can pick one. If you want to sin, just go pick a certain Bible out and you can get away with that sin today. Don't believe me? I dare you to go look. If you want to laugh like in a sad way, but kind of laugh, I mean, just read the message one. That's really horrible. And he said, like, hey, man, you're in charge. Do what you want to do. <laughs> Don't let anybody look down on you. You're in charge, man. <laughs> that's what he was saying to Timothy. If you read in 1 Timothy, that's what he was saying. <laughs> sad. We must separate from Rome's text. We must never use their perverted Bibles. We must, why do you think they hate the King James Bible? Rome hates it. Hates it! Hates it. <clears throat> why? Because it's the power of God, that's why. And it's the one that they didn't have their little dirty fingers on, that's why. Because they wanted their little dirty fingers on it. But they had a little bit of a problem because God and his providence made sure it didn't happen. Amen? <clears throat> Some believe that they even got so close that after the translation was over, they messed with the cover and used some masons to mess with the cover. <clears throat> but that's another story for another day. Anyway, do you know what the Jesuits think about the true word of God? Here's a quote from the Jesuits in history where he quotes from a Jesuit meeting in Cherie, Italy in 1825 and gives us shocking insight as to the Jesuits' true view of the Bible. And I quote, Then the Bible, that serpent, which with head erect and eyes flashing, threatens us, the Jesuits, with its venom, while it trails along the ground, shall be changed into a rod as soon as we, the Jesuits, are able to seize it. For three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no, res no repose. You will know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. The Jesuits in History, Hector McPherson, Ozark Book Publishers, 1997, Appendix 1. I mean, they hate the Bible that much? Well, sure they do. Well, when you could stand up and say, when they, in their catechism, they ask the question, well, if the Bible says something, the Pope says something different, what do we follow? You follow the Holy Father. That's what it says. Pope Clement... Now I want to read you some of the things that they tried to counter the Reformation and they fought against the Word of God. Okay, listen to this. Pope Clement VIII in 1592 to 1605, there's more. I mean, there's, I can't go back all the way, but there's quotes from way back, but I don't, we don't have time to do that, okay? <clears throat> uh, Pope Clement said this, confirmed the Council of Trent. Oh, that lovely Council of Trent there, right? Proclamations against Bible translations. Edie in his History of English Bible records this. And went even further by per forbidding licenses to be granted for the reading of the Bible under any conditions. Plain reasons against joining the Church of Rome in 1924, he wrote this. They weren't allowed to. He said, There's, you don't get to read the Bible. <sighs> the restrictions against ownership of the vernacular scriptures were repeated by the popes until the end of the 19th century. Benedict... The 14th, in 1740 to 1758, confirmed the Council of Trent's proclamations against Bible translations and issued an injunction that no versions, whatever should be suffered to be read, but those which should be approved of by the Holy See, accompanied by notes derived from the writings of the Holy Fathers or other learned and Catholic authors. Why didn't they approve the King James Bible? Why Sure does. They, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. By the way, that was from D.B. Ray's book, The Papal Controversy, page 
479, if you want to look that up, D.B. Ray. Um, it was during the reign of Pope Pius. Don't you love their names? Pope Pius. Pope Pius. Ah, good old Pope Pius. What's that? Bony face. Bony face. I like that guy. The Pope Bony face. Yeah, that guy's great. It was during the reign of Pope Pius, 1800 to 1823, that the modern Bible Society movement began. The British and Foreign Bible Society was formed in March 1804, the purpose being to encourage a wider circulation of the Holy Scriptures without note or comment. Other societies were soon created for the same exalted purpose. Germany in 1804, Ireland in 1806, Canada in 1807, Edinburgh in 1809, Hungary in 1811, Finland, Glasgow, Zurich, Prussia, Russia, Denmark, and Sweden the Netherlands, Iceland, America, Norway, and the Waldensians, Australia, Malta, Paris, etc. One of the societies began distributing a Polish Bible in Poland. The Pope, instead of praising the Lord that the eternal word of God was, was being placed into the hands of the multitudes of spiritually needy people, showed his displeasure by issuing a bull against Bible societies. On June 29, 1816, the Pope expressed himself as shocked by the circulation of the scriptures in the Polish tongue. He characterized this practice as a most crafty device by which the very foundations of religion are undermined, a pestilence which he, which he must remedy and abolish, a defilement of the faith eminently dangerous to souls. Pope Pius VII also rebuked Archbishop Buhas of somewhere in Russia because of his endorsement of a newly formed Bible society, the 19th century in Europe, page four. 48. The papal brief, dated September 3rd, 1816, declared that if the sacred scriptures were allowed in the vulgar tongue, everywhere without discrimination, more detriment than benefit would arise. Pope Leo XII, Pope Leo, Pope Leo, he issued a bull. He issued a bull. How does one issue a bull? I'm just I want to issue a bull. What's that mean to issue a bull anyway? Nate, do you know what that means to issue a bull? <laughs> is that what it is? A bull is a law, huh? Okay. <laughs> he issued a bull to the bishops of Ireland in May 3rd, 1824, in which he affirmed the Council of Trent and condemned Bible distribution. It is no secret to you, venerable brethren, that a certain society, vulgarly called the Bible Society, is audaciously spreading itself through the whole world. After despising the traditions of the Holy Fathers and opposing and in opposition to the well-known decree of the Council of Trent. Oh, the decree of the Council. This society has collected all its forces and directs every means to one object, the translation or rather the perversion of the Bible into the vernacular languages of all nations. If the sacred scriptures be everywhere indiscriminately published, more evil than advantage will arise thence on account of the rashness of men. The Bull of Leo. That's a good name, the Bull of Leo. This pope republished the Index of Prohibited Books on March 26, 1825, and mandated that the decrees of the Council of Trent be enforced against the distribution of scriptures. Pope Gregory the, the 16th, same thing, ratified the decrees, delivered in a former times by apostolic authority against the publication, distribution, reading, and possession of books of the Holy Scriptures translated in the vulgar tongue. I'm not going to read all these to you, but anyway. So we, we have to separate. There's more. There's more of that. We have to separate, though, with our Bible version. That's a very important way to separate. When you hold up this King James Bible and you separate from the modern translations and those that are based off of Westcott and Hort, you are making a statement to the Roman papacy. You're making a statement to the world that you will not accept their text. You will not accept their Bibles. You will not accept anything about them. But by the way, there also ought to be a separation from her whore daughters. There ought to be a separation from her whore daughters. We must out the mystery of iniquity at any cost. We must never accept the, the JWs, the Mormons, any of those cults that have, that, have, that have splintered, and even some of the Protestant denominations that have decided that they will follow Rome. They will make their agreement with Rome. We must never accept the mystery religions. We are not like BJU or Liberty University. We will not have Mormons come in and speak. We will not have those, is the Mormon my brother? No, he is a lost sinner on his way to hell. He is a deceived man. He is antichrist. Because it's all a part of Rome, the mom of Islam. You know, you, you see Islam is the same. You see this Chrislam movement that's being pushed by, by John's buddy Rick Warren there. 
Sorry, Brother John, I know you don't like Rick Warren. But, uh, but how about this? The charismatic religion, the charismatic movement, they've returned home to Rome. The Sodomites are going home to Rome. Many of the Lutherans are going home to Rome. I want to read this to you, then we'll be done. The Huffington Post article from 2013. Listen to what they agreed on. By the way, you don't need to have an agreement. I know Huffington Post is bad enough, isn't it? But they produce the truth. Yeah. In a monumental occasion for ecumenical relations, the U.S. Roman Catholic Church and a group of Protestant denominations planned to sign a document on Tuesday evening to formally agree to recognize each other's baptisms. Well, let me just say that they do have the same baptism as far as I'm concerned anyway with their sprinkling, which most of them have in their baptismal regeneration that a lot of them teach. Catholic leaders will join representatives from the Presbyterian Church the Christian Reformed Church in North America, the Reformed Church in America, and the United Church of Christ at the ceremony in Austin, Texas, to sign the agreement, which is called the Common Agreement of Mutual Recognition of Baptism. The event coincides with the, the national meeting of the Christian churches together in the USA. Currently, the Protestant churches recognize Roman Catholic baptisms, but the Catholic Church does not always recognize theirs. You mean Rome doesn't recognize every baptism? Neither do we. Because I don't recognize any of her, theirs or their children's. Amen. Currently, the Protestant church has recognized Roman Catholic baptism the mutual agreement on baptisms. A key sacrament in the churches has been discussed between denominational leadership for seven years and hinges in part on invoking the Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit during baptism. In a report, an Austin American statesman, Bishop Joe Vasquez of the Diocese of Austin, told the newspaper that the effort is part of our response to Jesus' prayer that we all be one. The Roman Catholic Church as a, as a whole has generally recognized the baptism of most mainstream Christian denominations since the Second Vatican Council, a series of historic church meetings from 1962 to 1965. But the formal baptism agreement is the first of its kind for the U.S. Church. According to a prior statement from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, which was released in 2010 when bishops were delivering the agreement, the understanding between the churches affirms that both Catholic and Reformed Christians hold that baptism is the sacramental bond of unity for the body of Christ. Maybe your universal invisible one. <clears throat> which is to be performed only once by an authorized minister with flowing water using the scriptural Trinitarian formula. Formula. You catching that? Why do you need a formula? Yeah, authorized by Rome. Which is to be performed only once by an authorized minister with flowing water using the scriptural Trinitarian formula of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The agreement encourages all local Christian communities to keep baptismal records. Now, why would they want you to keep baptismal records? Hmm. Why would they want those records? Why do the Mormons keep such good records? Who are they keeping them for? Here's a hint. Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of all harlots. The Austin newspaper reported that Tuesday's agreement says that for our baptisms to be mutually recognized, water in the scriptural Trinitarian formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit must be used in the baptismal rite. In 2002, concerns over certain practices such as baptism by sprinkling and spoken formulas such as baptism in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier used by some Christians led the Pontifical Council, oh, the Pontifical Council, for the promotion of Christian unity to urge national bishops' conferences to study their mutual understanding of baptism with other Christians. Well, first of all, Rome is not Christian. It's Antichrist. These questions were examined and resolved by round seven, oh, round seven, of the Reformed Roman Catholic Dialogue USA, which produced the common agreement, as well as the study entitled, These Living Waters. I thought you got washed in the blood, not in the tub. Huh? 
The agreement was first approved in 2008 by the General Assembly of Presbyterian Church. The American Catholic voted on it in 2010. Leaders voted on 2010. And the agreement was later approved by the governing bodies of the Christian Reformed Church in North America, Reformed Church in America, and the United Church of Christ. Oh, wonder why they did. You mean the Church of Christ? That's those Duck Dynasty guys. Oh. So you see, folks, these are the harlots of Rome. That is why, by the way, that's why Old Past Baptist Church, the way we remain separated and the way we practice this ecclesiastical separation is we only accept Baptist baptism here, and we only accept, we, only, we have closed communion here Amen. for members. We don't have communion with people that just pass through town that don't know us, and we're not going to have the Lord's table with them. We are a church, and we have responsibility here. I have a responsibility as a shepherd here. I can't control what goes on out there, but I am commanded to know what goes on in here. People say, yeah, but it says that uh, let a man so examine himself. It does, but that's before baptism. Before you get to that table, you've been scripturally baptized. Okay? And the second thing is it's, that's before any discipline. If we have a responsibility to judge those who are within, how can I not judge those that are without? How can I judge those that are without then? No, the responsibility is those within. That's why local churches are, are scriptural churches in the Bible. That's what the Bible says. There's not this in universal, invisible church everywhere that we're all just the church. Really? Well, who's in charge if we're all just the church? Who leads it? Who does the oversight? Who has responsibility for it? The Pope. That's right. He's in charge of the universal church. <laughs> That's right. Good point. <laughs> So you see, these churches are harlots of Rome. That's why we hold to our ordinances of baptism and closed communion. That's why we do not accept all baptisms here, and we don't practice open communion in these days of apostasy. It's a matter of separation. Because we'll, if we separate and obey God and follow Him, we will have the power of God here. But if we yoke ourselves up to idols, if we yoke ourselves up to harlots, if we yoke ourselves up to those that are walking disorderly, we will not have the power of God here. <clears throat> the Bible says to touch not the unclean thing. The church cannot join with the harlot church. When someone comes and is baptized here and joins our church, they are accepting fellowship and what we believe here. And they are in agreement with us. Their baptism states that they are, in a, they are a disciple of Christ following him, and they want to yoke up with us, and they believe that we are scriptural, and we're going to follow the Bible, and they want to be a part of that here. That's what that says when they join after they're baptized. We will not accept charismatics in this church unless they repent. And that is a public profession. If they've spoken in tongues, if they've practiced tongues, if they've never repented of that, they need to formally and publicly repent of it. In the assembly, that is, anyway. Because we will not yoke up to charismatics. It is the doctrine of devils. Right. We will not accept charismatic church. And we will not accept charismatic church baptism here because most, most of the time it's mixed with, with baptismal regeneration and sign gifts that must be accompany them in order for those people to even claim to be saved. We will not accept that. It's confusion, and we will not accept it. Amen. We will not accept charismatics like that. We will not accept Roman Catholics or their daughters. We, will not, we don't accept. We're not going to have a summit on whether we should accept sprinkling as baptism. Okay, the Bible already says the word baptism means immerse. We're not gonna we're not gonna have a summit about that and sit and talk, sit around and talk whether we would accept sprinkling. Why would we? Sprinkling's not baptism, immersion is. How can you call how can you call that baptism when you're not immersing anybody? That's the that's what the word means. It's ridiculous. Come on. Yeah, flowing water. By the way, we also defy the Pope and all his laws. All of them, everything, defy him, openly defy him. In fact, he's coming to America, and I want to go. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I want to go. Who's going with me, Brother Anthony? You coming? Let's go. I want to go. I don't care if we have to drive. Even if I, what's that? <laughs> I'm not going to feed you. No, I stopped with him like a bunch of times, didn't I? Oh, that's suffering for Jesus, but it's worth it. Amen? It's worth it. 
By the way, we push the King James Bible here without apology. We do not accept the other English versions of the scriptures because we know where they come from. And we can have that discussion with anybody who wishes to have it. We do not accept the ordinance from Rome or her children, and we are separated Bible-believing Baptists, and we make no apology for it. We are independent and make no apology for it, and we can only hold ourselves responsible and no others, but we will stay separated from Rome. As these end times roll along and we are seeing the prophecy of Revelation unfold right before our eyes. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 22 comes in mind as we close here. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Churches must separate from Rome. How about this? I want to leave you with this thought. By the way, the Anglican Church is the arm of Rome. You understand that, right? Those Church of England, England, all the, they, are, they are arms of Rome. Gone are the days of the mighty men that stood up in these denominations and stood against their heresy and defied Rome. Ian Paisley was one of those that stood up and defied the Pope. He went into the council. He was right there in that UN meeting, and he was a... He was a, uh, a uh, uh, he was in the government so he could get in there. And he went in there, and that's the first thing he did. He was defied the Pope, and he denounced him as Antichrist right there. And everybody's all mad, and that devil's sitting up there. Yeah, they grab him, and that devil's sitting up there smiling with a smile on his face, acting like he's Mr. Innocent, and he's a rotten devil is what he was. Yeah. He's burning in hell right now, too, for leading yeah. millions of people astray as well as his own soul. By the way, just so you understand the extent of Rome, Britain is controlled as well by that. The Dame of Malta, the Queen of England is a Dame of Malta. What does that mean? That means that she curtsies to him. How about that? And to the Black Pope, by the way. <clears throat> How about Ronald Reagan? Everybody talks about Ronald Reagan. Man, he was a great president, wasn't he? <sighs> he actually wasn't. You know why? Because the ambassador of the United States to the Holy See is the official representative of the United States of America to the Holy See, the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church. The official representation began with the formal opening of diplomatic relations with the Holy See by President Ronald Reagan and Pope John II in 1984. Between 1951 and 1968, the United States had no official representative accredited to the Holy See. President Richard Nixon changed this when he appointed Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. as his personal representative. President Jimmy Carter followed with the appointment of former New York City Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr. Every ambassador to date has been a Roman Catholic. The post is currently held by some ambassador, Ken Hackett. Anyway, what's the point? The point is that everybody that you think are Christians, these guys are part of an ecumenical movement. There was nothing. He restored diplomatic relations and recognized the Vatican. He was a Presbyterian. Let me ask you a question. Why would any God-fearing, Holy Ghost-filled man that's saved by the grace of God want to open up any relations with that devil over there? They wouldn't. Do you see why it's so important that we remain ecclesiastical as a church? We remain separated from Rome, from their text, from their churches, from their baptisms, from their, their fake ordinances that they do, from all of their witchcraft. We stay separated from them, and we boldly, we not only, we don't, not, we not only have no fellowship with them, but we rebuke them openly because deception is on the rise. Father, pray you bless us now. Thank you for truth. Thank you for the Bible you've given us. You've not left us without witness, Lord. Help us, Lord, please. Bless this time we have together. Bless the food. Bless the fellowship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.